ഹരി ബിസ്മില്ലാഹിം ടുഡേസ് সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ দিয়ে আমরা আজকের অনুষ্ঠান শুরু করছি আজকের ইভিনিং এ আমাদের প্রোগ্রাম থাকবে পেরিকার্ডিয়াল ডিজিজেস এন্ড টুডে সেশন উইল বি কন্ডাক্টেড বাই স্পেশাল আওয়ার গেস্ট প্রফেসর খন্দকার ডিফিউশন ইটিওলজি ক্লিনিক্যাল ফিচার্স এন্ড ডায়াগনোসিস ডাক্তার স্মিতা কানেনগু থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার ফর ইয়োর কাইন্ড ইন্ট্রোডাকশন রেসপেক্টেড মডারেটর এক্সপার্ট প্যানেল এন্ড লার্নড অডিয়েন্স ওয়ান্স अगेन আ ভেরি গুড ইভনিং আই এম স্মিতা কানেনগু वेलकम यू ऑल टू द प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन पेरिकार्डियल First let's have a very brief recapitulation on pericardium. Pericardium is composed of two layers, a visceral pericardium which consists of mesothelial cells and collagen elastin fibers closely adhering to the epicardial surface of the heart also known as epicardium. Another one is the parietal pericardium which is a fibrous layer and surrounds most of the heart. The space in between the two layers is known as the pericardial sac or space. which no, consists of about 15 to 50 ml of a pericardial fluid pericardium perform a variety of functions among them some are mechanical which include it limits short term cardiac distension maintains pressure volume relationship of the cardiac chambers also lubricates and minimizes friction pericardium also has a mechanical barrier to infection and act as a vehicle for drug delivery and gene therapy considering the distinctive signs and symptoms of different clinical presentation of pericardial disease the european society of cardiology guideline introduce a syndrome named pericardial syndrome the classical pericardial syndromes include pericarditis pericardial effusion cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis by name of pericarditis it is obvious that inflammation of pericardium is known as pericarditis there are different forms of pericarditis First, acute pericarditis, which means an inflammatory pericardial syndrome with or without pericardial effusion. Then, uh, incessant pericarditis means pericarditis lasting for more than four to six weeks, but less than three months without remission. And if this pericarditis lasting for more than three months, it is known as chronic pericarditis. and another form is recurrent pericarditis that means we recurrence of the pericarditis after a documented first episode of acute pericarditis and a symptom free interval of 4 to 6 weeks or longer that means after 4 to 6 of remission there will be reappearance of pericarditis features pericarditis is responsible for 0.1% of all hospital admission and acute pericarditis is uh, responsible for 0.2%. Men were more affected in comparing to women. And there are variety of etiological factors that are responsible for pericarditis. And these factors are divided in two groups, the infectious causes and the non-infectious causes. Among the infectious causes, viral and bacterial are the most common causes. And tubercular pericarditis is one of the most common causes in pericarditis. country developing country like ours among the non infectious causes idiopathic autoimmune secondary tumor neoplastic especially the secondary tumors are the most common causes and some drugs are also responsible for developing pericarditis now to diagnose acute pericarditis there are some clinical criteria such as pericarditic chest pain pericardial rub white spread ecg changes and pericardial effusion among these criteria two are mandatory to confirm the diagnosis of peri- acute pericarditis regarding the clinical feature a prodrome of 
fever, malaise, and myalgia may precede the complaints of chest pain of pericarditis. But typically, acute pericarditis produces a sharp retrosternal pain, and that radiates to the trapezius ridge. And sometimes this pain may mimic with the cardiac pain. But to its specificity, pericardial pain is uh, aggravated by lying down on, on inspiration and really. Patient may also complain of dyspnea, cough, and dysphagia. And on physical examination, pericardial friction rub is the hallmark of acute pericarditis. This rub is basically a scratchy or grating high pitch sound, which is best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, firmly placed in between the left lower sternal border and cardiac apex, with patient leaning forward and more on inspiration. 2015 ESC guidelines recommend the uh, investigations of ECG, X-ray, ECHO, and some inflammatory markers and myocardial injury as first-line investigation to diagnose the acute pericarditis. Among them, the ECG. In acute pericarditis, there will be widespread ST segment elevation and peer depression. Peer depression basically the earliest sign of ECG. Uh, all leads will show peer depression except in lead avia, which will show peer segment elevation, which is also known as knuckle sign. Here you can see widespread ECG elevation with peer segment elevation in a lead avia, other with peer segment depression. And there are four ECG changes which constitute the ECG changes in pericarditis in stage one. There will be peer segment depression, which is the earliest sign, and uh, ST segment elevation. And this elevation will be in concave shape in stage two. Both the peer segment and ST segment will be in isoelectric line, and there will be flattening of the T wave. Stage three, there will be T wave inversion, and this ECG change may persist for indefinitely, especially in patients with chronic pericarditis. Stage four, the ECG will be normalized. And this is the four stages of uh, ECG changes at a glance. Now to differentiate uh, in between acute pericarditis, STEMI and repolarization, there are some differentiating points through in ECG through which it can be differentiated. To memorize, some of them are the ST segment elevation. Already mentioned in acute pericarditis, it will be widespread and concave shape which is absent in STEMI. And the peer depression is obvious and must be present in pericarditis, which will be absent in both STEMI and early depolarization. Whereas uh, reciprocal ST changes is uh, common in STEMI and it's absent in both the acute pericarditis and early depolarization. Also, STEMI may have uh, Q waves and a long QT prolongation. And there will be some markers of inflammation in increase like ESR, high sensitivity, C-reactive protein, and WBC. CRP usually normalizes within one week in almost all cases by four weeks. And when pericarditis is associated with myocardial involvement, cardiac isoenzymes will also be increased. The chest X-ray usually appear normal, but it may give some clue regarding the presence of pleuropulmonary diseases like TB, mass lesion, or pulmonary lesion. And if it is associated with large pericardial effusion, then the X-ray may give a water bottle configuration. Like the X-ray echocardiography may appear normal, sometimes associated with pericardial effusion or wall motion abnormalities. And these are the second line investigation like computer tomography and cardiac magnetic resonance, which are basically needed to find out the etiology, sometimes may be necessary for the confirmation of diagnosis. This is an algorithm for the triage and initial management of pericarditis. A patient suspected with pericarditis will undergo for screening of presence of any of the risk factors, major or minor. If the patient have any of the risk factors, they will group as high risk cases. And if not, they will group as non-high risk cases and will be treated with NSI. If the patient respond with the NSI, they will be grouped at low risk cases 
If not, then will be moderate risk cases. Both moderate and high risk cases warrant their hospital admission, whereas the low risk cases may be treated as outpatient follow-up. This is also a class one indication. And the differential diagnosis includes STEMI, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, which can be differentiated thorough history and physical examination and also ECG. Regarding the management, restriction of physical activity beyond a sedentary life is recommended to, for the patients who are not involved in competitive sports. They are recommended uh, to have a rest until resolution of symptoms. But in patients who, who are athletes, the recommendation is for an arbitrary term of three months. And they are advised to rejoin their sports only after resolution of their symptoms and fully normalization of their CRP, ECG finding, and echocardiography finding. This is an anti-inflammatory -in therapy which are used for treating acute pericarditis, aspirin, ibuprofen, and colchicin. Colchicin is usually advised for three months. Steroid is indicated only as a second line therapy. There are some special situations where steroid is indicated like contraindication or to or failure of an NSAID or colchicin underlying conditions whose primary treatment is corticosteroid, steroid, concomitant disease and pregnancy. And whenever steroid is used, it should be started with low doses to minimize the complications. Cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis are the complications which are going to be discussed later. The overall prognosis is related to the etiology. It has been presumed that viral or idiopathic pericarditis have a good long-term prognosis. Recurrence are reported in about 15 to 30% of patients. And there are some factors which are associated for recurrence, which is termed as recurrent pericarditis. And these are inappropriate therapy of the first episode of pericarditis, low anti-inflammatory dose, short course, and non-prescription of colchicine, also using of high-dose corticosteroid. Treatment is are as of like acute pericarditis, but here colchicine is recommended for at least six months. Steroid may replace or be, can be added as triple therapy. For resistant cases, as a theoprine intravenous immunoglobulin and interleukin antagonists can be used, but still data are lacking for the use. This is the summary in short of dose and duration and tapering. Now, Sometimes pericarditis may be associated with myocardial involvement. There are two terms so when myocardium is involved. One is myopericarditis, another one is perimyocarditis. Myopericarditis means that pericarditis is predominant with concomitant myocardial involvement. And here LV function is normal. But perimyocarditis means predominant myocarditis with pericardial involvement. Here, a focal or diffuse LV function reduction is observed. In both cases, viral is the most common cause. The other include connective tissue disease, inflammatory bowel disease, radiation, and drug induced. The guideline for management, the guideline also recommended hospitalization for uh, is recommended for diagnosis monitoring. Cardiac magnetic resonance is recommended for the confirmation. And rest and avoidance of physical activity are recommended at least for six months in both athletes and non-athletes group. And in case of pericarditis, if they are suspected with myocardial involvement, coronary angiography is in considered during the clinical presentation and risk factor assessment. Now some specific form of pericarditis. Pericarditis with the renal disease, which usually has three main presentation form. Uremic pericarditis, dialysis pericarditis, and constrictive pericarditis, which is vesicle rare. Unlike the uh, typical features of pericarditis, here chest pain and are not very much frequently observed. Intensifying dialysis is the treatment option. Sometimes pericardiosynthesis may be needed for large pericardial effusion. Postcardiac injury syndrome, which include post MI pericarditis, both early and late post pericarditomy syndrome and post-traumatic pericarditis. To diagnosis post-cardiac injury syndrome, here is, has some diagnostic criteria like fever without an alternative cause, pleuritic chest pain, pericardial or pleural rub, 
and efficiently the pericardial or prudent and raised CRP. Treatment is uh, indicated with the empirical anti-inflammatory therapy. Now, uh, late post-MI pericarditis is also known as a Kressler syndrome, which is more common in large MI and usually occur from one week to few months. The patient usually present with the features of pericarditis along with the leukocytosis, raised PSR, and ECG changes, and echocardiograph is the most sensitive imaging study. Aspirin and colchicine are the drugs of choice, but the, in the era of primary PCI, both early and late complications are now decreasing in number. Now here's the last one, uh, pericarditis in pregnancy is usually due to viral or idiopathy. For the treatment options, NSAID may be prescribed during the first trimester and early second trimester, but after 20 weeks gestational, all NSAIDs are contraindicated as it may cause some constriction of the arterial ductus arteriosus and also impair the renal function of the new net. And colchicin also contraindicated and low dose corticosteroid can be used. So with this uh, slide, I would like to conclude to my presentation and send to say thank you to all of you. And thank you for all for the patient hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Smita Kanangu for your brilliant and informative presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Abu Tarek Iqbal. Please, Dr. Abu Tarek Iqbal. Respected moderators and panelists, my teachers, senior and junior colleagues, Assalamu Alaikum and very good evening. My topic is our topic is the pericardial effusion. I discuss on etiology, pathophysiology, clinical effusion. What is pericardial effusion? The pericardial space between the visceral and parietal layers of the pericardium normally contains less than 50 ml of fluid. Excessive accumulation of fluid in this space is called pericardial effusion. Classification of pericardial effusion. Classification according to onset, if less than uh, pericardial effusion occurs within less than three months, this is acute. If more than three months, this is chronic size. If it, in the eco-free space, less than 10 millimeters, this is mild. Eco-free space between the 10 to 20 millimeters, this is moderate. And eco-free space more than 20 millimeters, this is large. In case of mild, mild pericardial effusion, accumulation of fluid is 50 to 100 ml, moderate 100 to 50 ml, and large more than 50 ml. According to localization, if uh, fluid is accumulated surrounding the heart, this is circumference circumferential is accumulated along the one side of the wall, this is loculation. According to composition, this is divided into transudate and exudate. Transudate example are hemopericardium, biopericardium. Classification on hemodynamic impact, three types, non, effusive, and tamponate. Mechanism of pericardial effusion. There are two types of mechanism. Increased production as a result of inflammation of the serosal layer. This leads to exudative pericardial effusion. Impaired lymphatic drainage of the pericardial space as a result of increased central venous pressure. This is transudative pericardial effusion. Causes of the pericardial effusion. Idiopathic 50% cases, this is appropriate for the Western country, not for our country. Second cause is the infection, viral infection, Coxsackie virus A, adenovirus, influenza virus, and HIV virus. Bacterial infection, purulent, streptophylococcus, streptococcus, hemophilus influenzae. Tuberculosis, 50 to 60% in case of developing country. This is the main cause in our country as well as the third world. The tuberculosis is the predominant cause. Leads to 50 to 60 percent. In Western country, main cause is the idiopathic 50 percent. Another is fungal infection, histoplasmosis, and aspergillosis. Immunologic and inflammatory disorder, rheumatic fever, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, polymyositis, dermatomyositis. 
following acute myocardial infarction, metabolic, eudemia, and mixed edema. Trauma, post pericardial syndrome, with pericardiomyotomy syndrome, this occurred uh, following uh, uh, cardiac surgery, trauma to the chest, or following PCI. Another is the neoplastic, primary mesothelioma, teratoma, metastatic, breast carcinoma, lymphoma, leukemia, and bronchogenic carcinoma. There are some drugs which may lead to pericardial effusion. Most common is the heparin, warfarin, hydrology. Another is the radiation and defecting thoracic aneurysm. Clinical features of the pericardial effusion. Along the clinical features, symptoms. Symptoms of patient with pericardial effusion. This depends on the size, acuity, and underlying causes of the effusion. Some patients may be asymptomatic, and the effusion may be an incidental finding on exam. Large effusion may present with chest compression, chest pain, dyspnea, shortness of breath, orthopnea, malaise, or fatigue. Patient may also present with non-cardiac symptoms due to the compression of nearby structure, can lead to dysphagia due to compression of the sphagnum, hoarseness of voice due to compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and hiccup due to irritation of the phrenic nerve. Signs. A small effusion does not give any specific sign. Large effusion produces following signs. Patient may appear anxious, pulse tachycardia, epigebic not visible, neither palpable, increased cardiac dullness, your sign, this important sign, dullness on percussion and bronchial breath sound below the angle of the left scapula due to compression of the left lower lobe bronchus. On a concussion, pain heart sound and bronchial breath sound in at the left scapula. In, along this investigation, these are ECG. ECG reflects that there is sinus tachycardia, generalized low voltage QRS complex, and electrical alternator. XHS CABO showing large globular heart, usually the clear lung field. This is very important. There is a globular shaped heart, but lung field is clear. Echocardiography, 2D echo is important, and this is the most specific investigation for diagnosis of the pericardial effusion. In 2D echocardiography, we show the echo free space surrounding the heart. There are, we have seen echo free space along the posterior wall. Echocardiography, grading of pericardial effusion. If we see echo free space in the posterior, wall less than 10 millimeter, this is mild. If the posterior wall echo free space 10 to 20 millimeter, this is moderate pericardial effusion. If in the posterior wall more than 20 millimeter, this is severe. And there is accumulation of the anterior wall. Fluid in the anterior wall is more than less than 10 millimeter, this is moderate. If more than 10 millimeter, this is severe pericardial Investigation, cardiac CT, you can do the cardiac CT for diagnosis, cardiac MRI, and there are some investigations to find out the etiology of pericardial effusion. Complete blood count, Montauk test to detect the tuberculosis, urea serum creatinine, if any, if there is uh, uh, any chronic kidney disease, C4 and PHS to, for the diagnosis of mixed edema, are effector as a titer to, uh, to diagnose any rheumatic disease. Another investigation, pericardial fluid analysis. This is not for the diagnosis, but to diagnose the etiology of the cause of pericardial effusion. We can send uh, pericardial effusion, chemistry, cytology, biomarker, PCR, and microbiology. In the chemistry, if a specific gravity more than 1050, protein level more than 3 gram per dl, and LDH more than 200 milligram per dl, this is exudative. Cytology. We can do the, we do the cytology only to detect the cancer cell. This is appropriate for the diagnosis of carcinoma. Biomarker, there are two types of biomarker, more important tumor marker for detection of the carcinoma, and adenosine DMNA, which is very important for detection of the tuberculosis. If we get uh, if the adenosine DMNA is 40 units per liter, this goes in favor of tuberculosis. Polycardial 
polymerase chain reaction for uh, a specific infectious agent, specific for uh, tuberculosis by PCR, we can diagnose the tuberculosis. Microbiology, by microbiology, we diagnose uh, both FBS and microbacterium culture for detection of the tuberculosis and aerobic and anaerobic culture to detect the other pyogenic organisms. Cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is the complication of the pericardial effusion. Cardiac compression, what is cardiac tamponade? Cardiac compression due to increased intrapericardial pressure, secondary to pericardial effusion, resulting in restriction of ventricular diastolic release and reduction of the stroke volume. Cause of the pericardial tamponade, same like pericardial effusion, idiopathic infection, immunological, acute uh, myocardial infarction, metabolic uremia, myxedema, following trauma. I have discussed already in the uh, chapter of pericardial effusion, some neoplastic cause, there is some drug, radiation, and detection for us is available. What is the pathophysiology of the uh, uh, pericardial tamponade? This is very important. In cardiac tamponade, there is accumulation of the fluid into the pericardial space. So pericardial fluid under pressure, this leads to impaired diastolic filling of ventricle. If there is impaired diastolic filling of the ventricle, this leads to elevated venous pressure and impaired stroke volume. If there is elevated venous pressure, systemic leads to systemic venous congestion and pulmonary venous congestion. Systemic venous congestion leads to jugular venous distension, hepatomegaly, ascites, and peripheral edema. Pulmonary venous congestion leads to pulmonary wave. If there is impaired stroke volume, this leads to decreased cardiac output, leads to hypotension, and leads to reflex tachycardia. Clinical presentation of the pericardial tamponade. Symptom, patient is restless, agitation, drowsiness, is stupor, dyspnea due to low output, there is chest discomfort, syncope or near syncope. Signs, clinical signs, tachypnea, sweating, cold and calm activity, pulse tachycardia, feeble pulse, and pulses paradoxal. Pulses paradoxal normally, we, pulses paradoxal, this is a misnomer. Pulses paradoxal, we diagnose by measuring the blood pressure. Uh, we measure uh, the systolic blood pressure during inspiration and exhalation. Normally, uh, this variation is less than 10 millimeter of mercury. If it is more than 10 millimeter of mercury, this causes pulses paradoxal. Blood pressure hypotension, JBP, elevated JBP, prominent exhibition, and absent white descent. Cardiovascular system examination, palpation, apex is not palpable, percussion increased cardiac dullness, auscultation diminished heart sound. There is important trial in a case of a pericardial tamponade, this is the back trial. In back trial, that means there is a component of the three symptoms, jugular venous distension, distant heart sound, and hypotension. These three leads to back trial. Investigation. Investigation leads to sinus tachycardia. ECG is the most important investigation. Sinus tachycardia, generalized low voltage QRS complex, electrical alternate, that means one QRS is long, another is short alternate, this is electrical alternate. This is the 2D echocardiography, presence of pericardial effusion, RA diastolic collapse, they have, you are seeing the RA diastolic collapse, RB early diastolic collapse, and inspiratory collapse of inferior banana collapse. Echocardiography, Doppler echocardiography, there is a respiratory variation, exaggerated respiratory variation of the atrioventricular inflow detected on the pulse Doppler. The upper figure shows the uh, mitral inflow pattern, expiratory direction of the mitral peak, inspiratory direction of the mitral peak, your velocity more than 30%. In the lower panel showing, expiratory direction in tricuspid peak wave velocity more than 60 percent. XHS, XHS behavior showing short large globular heart, usually clear lung tissue. We can do the cardiac CT, cardiac MRI for the 
diagnosis of the pericardial tamponade. Thank you for patient care. Thank you, Dr. Abu Tarek Iqbal. Next presenter is Dr. Tofik Shari Al Haq, Associate Professor. Please, Dr. Tofik Shari Al Haq. Assalamu alaikum, respected moderator, uh, members of the expert panel, and dear senior and junior colleagues. So, I will be talking on management of pericardial effusion. By now we know pericardial effusion may be classified according to its onset, distribution, hemodynamic impact, composition, and size based on a simple semi-quantitative echocardiographic assessment. So pericardial effusion is a common finding in our everyday practice for cardiologists. Cause is obviously related to an underlying general or cardiac disease or to a syndrome of inflammatory or infectious pericarditis. In these cases, the main issue are etiology, the clinical course, and possibility of evolution to hemodynamic embarrassment. The different investigators have uh, published uh, their series of uh, investigations on uh, incidence of uh, pericardial effusion, and they have uh, mainly concentrated on etiology, incidence of uh, pericardial tamponade, and they have used different uh, uh, quanti quantification to uh, quantify small, medium, or large. And in some series, they have given 5 millimeter to be large. And the uh, commonest etiology they have shown is uh, neoplastic, uremic, or idiopathic. And incidence of uh, tamponade in different series varied from 25 to 40 percent. So when we have a patient with pericardial effusion, the First step is to assess its size, its hemodynamic importance, possible uh, associated disease. Pericardial effusion is often associated with different known medical conditions. When there is mild pericardial effusion, that is the effusion is less than 10 millimeter on echocardiogram, uh, this may be an incidental finding. In these patients, neither invasive studies nor treatments are required. A follow-up echocardiogram is probably warranted to see if the echocardiogram findings are unchanged, further investigation or treatment uh, of these patients is not necessary if the echo findings are stable. In mild pericardial effusion, uh, the therapy is targeted towards the etiology. In about 60% of cases, effusion is associated with known disease, and the essential treatment is that of the underlying disease like uh, hypothyroidism. When pericardial effusion is associated with pericarditis, management should follow that of pericarditis. So when it becomes uh, symptomatic without evidence of inflammation or when empiric anti-inflammatory drugs are not successful, drainage of the effusion should be considered. If it is a large pericardial effusion without actual or threatened tamponade, in those cases, uh, the absence in those cases can be managed a bit leisurely. The effusions are by definition chronic, otherwise tamponade would be present. They are in general stable and specific causes usually are not evident. But the issue is in 30% of these cases, they may develop tamponade. And after close pericardial synthesis, the effusions rarely reaccumulate. Re Before pericardial synthesis in these cases, a course of NSAID or colchicine should be considered because this will shrink some of the effusions. A course of corticosteroid may have the same effect, but its use is controversial. Uh, one issue with patients uh, in large pericardial effusion in patients receiving anticoagulants. Unexplained effusion in these patients should be thoroughly evaluated to exclude hemorrhage. Anticoagulants should be discontinued temporarily if possible to reduce the risk of developing tamponade. In patients on chronic oral anticoagulation, heparin should be used because its effect can be reversed rapidly. The management of anticoagulation in patients with acute pericarditis and effusion requires careful analysis of the competing risks and benefits. In some cases of acute pericarditis, they generally respond to NSAID. And in low risk patients, while using NSAID, the anticoagulant can be withheld. But when effusions with or actual thin tamponade, these patients should be considered to be a true potential uh, medical emergency. Hospital admission and hemodynamic 
and echocardiography monitoring is mandatory. Most patients require pericardiosynthesis. Uh, treatment should be individualized, and pericardiosynthesis is contraindicated in tamponade is due to aortic dissection. Uh, the quantity of fluid necessary to produce this critical state may be as small as 200 ml when the fluid develops rapidly or more than 2000 ml even in slowly developing effusions. Uh, this fluid can be blood, clot, uh, exudative or transudative fluid or even pus. One thing we should emphasize that uh, presence of tamponade is not an all and none. It, is a, it has a wide spectrum. On one end of the spectrum are asymptomatic tamponade, which, patient, which can only be diagnosed through hemodynamic assessment. And on the other hand, uh, there will be cases with uh, who present with uh, breathlessness, orthopnea, raised JVP, uh, leg swelling, and even, even shock. And in between are cases uh, which can be diagnosed through echocardiography as chamber collapse or mitral or uh, tricuspid infravelocity differences in inspiration and expiration. In mild or low pressure tamponade, uh, when the etiology is idiopathic, vital or responsive to specific therapy, it does not require pericardiosynthesis. In contrast, hyperacute tamponade necessitates immediate pericardiosynthesis at initial triage measure. However, the majority of patients fall between these two extremities and will need to undergo drainage. Once tamponade is diagnosed, intravenous hydration should be instituted. Administration of 500 ml of normal saline during 10 minutes modestly increases arterial pressure and cardiac output in about 50% of patients with tamponade. Positive inotropes can also be employed, but we must remember hydration and positive inotropes are temporizing measures. They will not substitute pericardial drainage. But, and one very important thing, these patients present with orthopnea or dyspnea, administration of diuretic is strongly contraindicated that could be fatal. Here is a, a, a scoring system that ESC has given us to uh, decide where the patient needs, how emergency is pericardiosynthesis. So we scored the patient in three groups on score on etiology, there is score on clinical presentation and score on base of imaging. You can see the scores on uh, etiology when there is malignancy or tuberculosis patient gets two points each for clinical presentation when there is uh, orthopnea in the absence of uh, lung rails on the lungs, it gives you three points. When imaging there is uh, 20, more than uh, 20 millimeter effusion on diastole, it gives you two points. When there is LA collapse, it gives you three points. When you have six or more, you go for urgent pericardiosynthesis. If it's less than six, you can wait. But one thing, if there is, you have six points, but there is type A dissection, ventricular free wall job, rupture, or severe uh, issue of chest trauma. In those cases, you have to go for surgical management. For our our region, where there uh, where tuberculosis is uh, very common, there is another system which says if there is heart rate more than 90, systolic pressure less than 100, pulses paradoxes, jugular venous was mold, more than four plus. Eco confirmation of circumferential pericardial effusion measuring more than 10 millimeter anterior RV in subcoastal view, or any of the following from swinging heart, RV or LV diastolic collapse, more than 25% variation in mitral inflow velocities, then you can go, you should go for urgent pericardial drainage. Effect of pericardial synthesis uh, is often immediate. A few, few millimeter drainage of efficiency significantly increases stroke volume, reduces intrapericardial and arterial pressure, permits separation between right and left filling pressures. Tachycardia and dyspnea decrease, arterial pressure increases, and pulses power paradoxes uh, uh, disappears. The safety of this procedure has been improved by using two dimensional echocardiography uh, guidance, and the major complications are only 1.2%. Drainage of the pericardial fluid using a catheter minimizes trauma, allow measurement of pericardial pressure and installation of drugs. An extended uh, uh, catheter drainage for three to five days uh, uh, associated with train towards lower recurrence rate. Drainage should be continued until the aspirate volume is less than 25 ml per day. And when there is blockage in the, in the uh, catheter drainage, uh, we can give heparin or fibrinolytic agents. Uh, even if there is purulent uh, collection, you can also give fibrinolytic agent. 
recurrent effusions may be treated with uh, repeated pericardial synthesis, but uh, a subcostal pericardiectomy is preferred in patients with neoplasia or uremia undergoing uh, dialysis when life expectancy is more than one year. If there, uh, if there are certain contraindications when we should uh, avoid pericardial synthesis, like effusion is less than 10 millimeter, hemopericardium due to dissection, ventricular fuel rupture, trauma, purulent effusion in unstable in septic patients, or when there is loculated effusions. Irrespective, as Tarek has already said, irrespective of the method of retrieval, pericardial fluid should be sent for cell count, glucose, gram stain, ZN stain, cytology, and culture. Depending on clinical circumstances, tumor markers. Someone has asked a question, what tumor markers? Tumor markers are carbohydrates like CA19, CA29, CA27, which are from, for breast tumor, bone tumor. They can be found in uh, uh, pericardial fluid. And adenosine DMINs uh, interferon activity are high in cases of uh, tuberculosis. And we can do PCR, which is now kind of gene expert for uh, tuberculosis. A few uh, slides on pericardial synthesis. We can see there are three approaches, the apical, the parasternal, or the sub -zipoid. The sub is the uh, commonest practice in our region. So uh, we take the uh, needle in a 45 degree angle and uh, towards the left shoulder. Uh, let me try to show this video. I hope it runs. So, um, here we go. Uh, this is a pericardial needle towards the left shoulder. And um, we do it in a 45 degree angle. And we take that uh, small area between the zephoid, pro zephoid process and the left coastal margin. We advance the needle. We cross the diaphragm, the liver, and this potential space and reach the pericardium keep a negative suction and once you have entered and you, you have you are able to aspirate some fluid you disconnect the needle and uh, put in a guide wire into the pericardium there is the guide wire and move the needle put in a catheter pigtail catheter And you can uh, suture the pigtail catheter and uh, gradually uh, take out the uh, effusion. And, the and once it is relieved, you can uh, follow your guidelines to take out the, take out the catheter later. And uh, when we do it in a... Um, And when we want to do it in a fluoroscopy under fluoroscopy guidance, you can see we are doing local injection. This is our this is our uh, target uh, target region where we are going to put in the needle. And in lateral, it's even easier. This is where we are going to put our, put in our needle. And uh, in in the next frame, you will see these are the instruments. We all know here goes the needle. In a negative, you always have to keep a negative suction. We can see the needle in the fluoroscopy going into the angle. And once the fluid comes in, you can detach the syringe and put in your uh, wire. You can see the uh, wire in the uh, in the fluoroscope. This is how it looks in lateral, and this is the epidural. Then you can put in your catheter and uh, go in for a drainage. So the most serious complications may be death, very rare, injury to the cardiac chambers laceration of the coronary arteries or intercostal vessels, puncture of the abdominal viscera, and pneumothorax requiring chest uh, drainage. There is a syndrome called pericardial decompression syndrome. Rapid uh, aspiration of fluid may cause this. Myocardial and coronary puncture may initially be silent and present with delayed hemopericardium. Uh, minor complications in include vasovagal hypotension and so on. The prognosis of pericardial infusion is essentially related to the etiology. Uh, a mild infusion is usually asymptomatic uh, moderate to large effusion may worsen, as we have already uh, discussed. A few words about tubercular effusion. Tuberculosis is a major cause of pericarditis and effusion in our country and in the Western world. The, its incidence is increasing due to HIV infection, 
peregrine fluid is said to be uh, definitely due to the tuberculosis if you can demonstrate tubercular bacilli in the fluid or in the pericardium. It is probable when there is a uh, 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 lymphocytic pericardial exudate, uh, PCR showing uh, uh, DNA or good response to antitubular therapy. And it is presumptive if the patient has history of exposure or if it is a uh, montostasis positive. Patient, these patients should receive uh, a, a conventional four drug regime for six months. Nine month uh, regime has not shown to be of any extra benefit. Uh, steroid corticos, oral corticosteroid 2 milligram per kg for six weeks and then gradual tapering gives uh, some benefit. Failure to improve or worsening over one to two months, pericardial thickening or evidence of constriction require urgent pericardiotomy. And finally, a few words about myocardial infarction related pericardial effusion. It is associated with anterior uh, MI, large infarct on the when the patient is in failure. When pericardial effusion in MI is associated with tamponade, we usually take it for cardiac rupture, hemorrhagic pericarditis, or aortic dissection involving right coronary artery. And recent studies have shown after primary PCI, 4% of the patients may develop uh, uh, pericardial effusion on the fourth year of MI. So we have more, in, more interesting lectures coming up. I would like to end my lecture here. Thank you for your kind patience. Thank you, Dr. Taufik. It's a very good presentation. A lot of information is there. A lot of procedures are there. Next presenter is Professor Badu Jawan. Professor Badu Jawan will tell, deliver the very important subject that is the constrictive pericarditis. That is Mr. Moderator and uh, dear colleagues and honorable panelists. My topics of discussion today is constrictive pericarditis. So, uh, my uh, talk will contain uh, uh, the following topics. I will be talking about the following aspects of constrictive peric pericarditis. So, first uh, definition uh, constrictive pericarditis of, of whatever cause restricts the ability of the ventricle to respond to the hemodynamic changes in the preload. So therefore it's a form of diastolic heart failure. This uh, constriction usually involves perica parietal pericardium, although it can involve visceral pericardium. So this is the gross anatomy. As you can see, this is a normal pericardium. It is thin, elastic, translucent, and strong covering the heart. But this pericardium, it, when diseased, it becomes thickened by inflammation and fibrosis which ultimately may result of this thickening and scarring of the pericardium. So uh, look at this picture. This is the, uh, someone is knocking the heart with a forceps. Look at the, uh, you can uh, just listen to the sound as if someone is hitting the stone. This is the calcified pericardium of a patient with uh, pericarditis in operating theater. So what is the etiology? It is almost similar to the etiology of pericardial effusion previously described by uh, previous presenter. The common form is idiopathic and the other is infection of which tuberculosis is most common in this part of the world, other bacterial and viral. Radiation, radiation thoracic or medicinal radiation due to, uh, mainly due to uh, as a part of uh, radiotherapy in, uh, of malignant patients. And uh, lastly, cardiac surgery, uh, for example, CABG. This post-cardiac surgery, constant pericarditis is rising day by day with uh, more and more cardiac surgery being done throughout the world. So this cause is coming up, even it is uh, coming above uh, the idiopathic cause in the world. So less uh, common forms are uh, infection, fungal infection, mainly in immunocompromised patient. Again, neoplasm, uh, see a lung, breast, lymphomas, uremia. Patient who are undergoing uh, hemodialysis for a long time may under develop constant pericarditis. Connective tissue disorder like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, scleroderma. There are some drugs which may cause, as you have seen, procainamide, hydralazine, methysergite, trauma. And lastly, myocardial infarction. Usually, the patient uh, develops Dessler syndrome or they develop hemopericardium after thrombolytic therapy. These patients may ultimately develop to constitute pericarditis. The epidemiology actually, uh, approximately 9% of the acute pericarditis from any cause 
go on to develop constrictive, constrictive pericardity. And hospital, USA hospital-based data suggests that a stable prevalence of nine to 10 cases per million, age reported from eight to 70 years, the mean median age is 45 and male to female ratio is six to one. What is the risk of progression to constrictive pericarditis? It is least with viral and idiopathic pattern, highest with bacterial pericarditis, especially with prolonged pericarditis. Now, what is the pathogenesis? How and why? Actually, we don't know why uh, some of the patient with uh, pericarditis develops constrictive pericarditis, other than not done. But there is a proposal which is not yet proved is that uh, the mesothelial cell damage from pericardial insult, they cause reduction in the tissue type plasminogen activator, which results in reduced uh, fibrinolytic activity, and that results in fibrinous infusion, uh, inflammation, and uh, um, adhesion formation. And that results in constant pericarditis. This whole uh, cycle may take several days, months, or years before presentation. So, what is the pathophysiology? First of all, there is injury to the pericardium, which causes acute, subacute, or chronic inflammation and results in pericardial thickening, scarring, and calcification. And this results in significantly impaired diastolic filling and venous return. As a result, there is systemic venous congestion, and this systemic venous congestion results in edema, raised JVP, ascites, hepatic congestion, insufficiency, and cachexia. On the other hand, this significantly impaired diastolic filling also reduces the cardiac output, and this results in dyspnea and fatigue. So hemodynamics. This is the most complicated and most important part of this talk, and I will be taking more time on this topic. Uh, it's quite boring, but I think uh, you will bear with me. First of all, what is the main uh, two effect of constrictive pericarditis? Number one, dissociation of intrathoracic and intraventricular pressure. That is, the intrathoracic pressure is not transmitted to the ventricles. And number two, there is ventricular interdependence. That is, left ventricular and right ventricular is dependent on each other. These two factors actually governs all other hemodynamic features. So let's see what happens during inspiration. In, during inspiration, the negative intrathoracic pressure is mainly, mainly transmitted to pulmonary vein and SBC, not to the chambers or IVC. So what happens? The gradient from pulmonary vein to LA is negative. So no blood flows from LA to LV. So the septum pushes towards LV. On the other hand, IVC because during inspiration, intraabdominal pressure increases. So all the blood rushes from I through the IVC to the RA to RV, RV dilates and pushes the R septum to the LV and RA pressure rises. And this in turn gives rise to Kussmaul sign, what we know as Kussmaul sign. So what happens during expiration is all, almost uh, opposite. Here also during expiration, the positive intrathoracic pressure is transmitted again to pulmonary vein and SBC, not to the chambers or IVC. So now there is gradient from pulmonary vein to LA. So blood flows from pulmonary vein to LA to LV. So the septum pushes towards the RV. There is no blood flow through IBC and very, very little blood flow from SBC. So RA, RV pressure decreases and LA, LV pressure rises and the septum pushes towards the RV. So in short, what happens here, is called ventricular interdependence. Both RA and RV are constricted within a stiff shell of pericardium. So change of volume of one chamber reflects on the other. And so the septal bounce occur with respiration. Actually, this is the exaggeration of otherwise normal ventricular interdependence. As you can see here, during inspiration, the septum is pushed towards LV and during expiration, the septum is pushed towards RV. This is called ventricular interdependence. And what is ventricular discordance? As you can see here, the pressure pressing, during expiration, there is a gradient between LV pressure and pulmonary capillary waste pressure. So this gradient allows flow from uh, pulmonary vein to LV during expiration. But during inspiration, this gradient almost becomes nil. So there is no flow during inspiration. In contrast, in restricted cardiomyopathy, both in expiration and inspiration, these gradients are maintained. So blood always flows through the pulmonary vein to a, a pulmonary vein to LA to LV. So this is a, a, one important thing. And another important thing of discordance, you can see during inspiration, LV pressure decreases, 
but RV pressure rises. During expiration, RV pressure decreases and LV pressure rises. This is called ventricular discordance. This discordance has a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 95% for the diagnosis of constant pericarditis. So this feature is very important hemodynamically for diagnosis of difficult cases of constant pericarditis. Now, what are the waveforms in constant pericarditis? Number one is there is a prominent wide descent, which is uh, which resembles to the actually which corresponds to the rapid filling of the ventricle, and there is a x descent, which is less uh, to a lesser extent, and there is significantly raised RA pressure. And what happens in the all the chambers? There is elevation and equalization of diastolic pressure of all the heart chamber, both LA, RA, LV, RV. All the chambers are having same diastolic pressure within the range of five millimeter of mercury. And this is also a hallmark of constantly pericarditis. Another important which comes to exam uh, uh, as a heart is called deep and plateau uh, pattern or square root sign. As you can see in normal pattern, there's a rapid flow, then a slow flow and diastasis and then end diastolic pressure. These are normal pattern, but in constantly pericarditis, there is abnormally rapid early diastolic filling then abbreviated late diastolic filling, which halts abruptly here due to the limitation imposed by the constricted pericardium. So this is called dip and plateau or square root sign. Constant pericarditis. And another important thing is the raised elevated RV systolic pressure. RV systolic pressure is always elevated, but not more than 50. And more importantly, RV end diastolic pressure is more than one third of RV systolic pressure. These are, these are sounds quite complicated, but well, I will summarize later on. So what are the respiratory variation of RA pressure? We know during inspiration, the RA pressure should in, uh, easily decrease it, but here the central venous pressure or RA pressure failed to decline, or it may even sometimes increase during inspiration, giving rise to the small sign and less than three millimeter decrease in RA pressure during inspiration is not, has a 90% sensitivity for diagnostic constant pericarditis. This is the equation, uh, just remember the question, it's very simple, just you see, it's the equation, they call it systolic air, uh, area index. It's a ratio between RA, RV area divided by LV area in, in inspiration, RV area divided by LV area in expiration. This ratio is very important. You can see if the ratio is more than 1.4, it has a sensitivity of 75, 17, uh, 97% and predicted accuracy of 100% for identifying constant pericarditis. So in contrast, you see, these are all the list of hemodynamic parameters which are done in patients with constant pericarditis of which only these two are very important, which I have seen. One is RV, LV interdependence and one is the last one, the systolic area index, which has a very high sensitivity and specificity. So after all these complex hemodynamic features, let's come to the very simple one, that's a clinical feature. From history, what we can get, as dyspnea is most common, the patient can give fatigue, lower extremity edema, abdominal swelling and discomfort, nausea, vomiting, right upper quadrant pain due to hepatic and bowel congestion, chest pain. It may be occurred due to active inflammation and interestingly, maybe due to compression on the coronaries. Other symptoms are fatigability, fever, palpitation, diaphoresis, PND. Physical examination in early stage is very subtle, but in more advanced stage, patient is ill-looking, muscle wasted, cachexia, jaundice. In a uh, myoclinic uh, experience, uh, in a myoclinic experience, uh, they have seen that 95% of the patient had increased JVP and hepatomegaly, and less than 25% patient had pericardial knock, muscle wasting, and very few of them had clubbing. So this is a sign of uh, jugular venous pressure, as you can appreciate. This is not the jugular vein. This is the external jugular vein, but the internal jugular vein pressure is behind the scarnacular mastoid. Similarly, here also you can see, this is the external jugular vein, but the jugular venous pressure is seen just behind the scarnacular mastoid. Both of these one is, is Cosmol signs and Frederick signs. Here is an, another patient with uh, jugular venous pulsation in a patient with constrict peripartis. This is the scarnacular mastoid. And just behind the gastronomic mastoid, you can see the jugular venous pressure. So what is the clinical feature? Uh, in the cardiovascular, there is elevated JPP. Uh, important thing is, uh, while, while examining JPP in a patient with constant pericarditis, you may need to, uh, the patient may need to sit or even stand because 
the JVP may be so raised that it goes beyond the angle of the mandible. So patient have to stand up to see the upper limit of the JVP sometimes. There is sinus tachycardia, low BP, apical impulse is impossible. Pericardial lock is present only in 50% of case along the left sternal border mistaken for S3. Cardiac murmur usually absent unless there is vulvar disease. Pulsus paradox is variable and rarely exists 10 millimeter. And postmal sign, it is common but non-specific because some other disease also have the same sign. Other symptoms, hepatomegaly, 70% of cases, chronic size, uh, features of chronic hepatic congestion like ascites, angioma, pulmonary erythema, and dependent edema. So this is the pericardial knock. You can listen to this. It. I think it is audible. If so, you can see just after the S2, this is the asterisk. Here comes the uh, pericardial knock. So differential diagnosis. Before going to differential diagnosis, we should remember any patient who presents with unexplained dyspnea, GI symptoms, ascites, or edema, the clinician must always keep constant pericarditis in the differential diagnosis. The most difficult differential diagnosis is restricted cardiomyopathy with so many features in common with constant pericarditis. Others are systolic or diastolic constant heart failure for a number of causes like pressure overload, myocardial, vulvar, or atherosclerotic disease, Cardiac tamponade, again, a very difficult uh, differential diagnosis. Right-sided valvular abnormalities like TSTR, right-sided atrial tumor like myxoma, superovenacoma syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, even primary liver disease. So workup, how to approach? Actually, no laboratory data is diagnostic of constant pericarditis. All the biochemical abnormalities that are present are due to chronically elevated RA pressure and passive congestion of the liver, kidney, and GI tract. So this is the biochemistry. CBC may show dilutional anemia. Kidney may show dysfunction by raised creatinine urea. Liver raised transaminases and bilirubin. Monto test and other serological tests should be done to rule out tuberculosis. There may be hyperalbuminemia due to protein losing anthropathy. Electrolytes may show dilutional hyponatremia. Arterial gas may show metabolic acidosis. Periocardial fluid, if present, should be sent for cytological and biochemistry. ANA and rheumatoid factor for any collagen vascular disorder. And BNP are usually normal or mildly elevated. But importantly, it is markedly elevated in restricted cardiomyopathy. This is one point to distinguish between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive pericarditis. ECG, there is no diagnostic ECG change. Uh, non specific ST segment uh, changes may be there. Low voltage ECG if efficient is present. And arterial fibrillation are quite common. This is actually an ECG of acute pericarditis. Chest radiograph actually is unremarkable. Only 20 or 30 percent of 20 to 30 percent of cases, their severe calcification are present. So both PA and lateral views should be taken. You can see here the calcification around the, but it's only present in 20 to 30 percent of cases. Cardiac shellot is really normal if there is no effusion. Pleural effusion is present in 35 to 50 percent of cases, or it is bilateral. And surprisingly, 28 percent of patients may have normal pericardial thickness. So echocardiography, again, it's as complex as hemodynamics. So I will leave here to the expert of our echo, Professor Tuin Hock. She will be teaching us about the echocardiography feature of constant pericarditis. After she finishes, I will continue to my rest of my talk. So Professor Tuin Hock, please enlighten us with your lecture. So, honorable moderator, respected panelists, distinguished audience, and my dear students. My job is to present the echocardiographic diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. According to ESC guideline, a transthoracic echocardiography is recommended in all patients with suspected constrictive pericarditis. However, there is no single echocardiographic finding that is pathogenic for the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. When all the echo data are taken together with the clinical text, the likelihood of constriction can usually be accurately assessed. There are many 2D and M mode echo uh, criteria that can suggest constrictive pericarditis, like thickened and hygogenic pericardium. That may not be in all cases. The thickened and hygogenic pericardium may not be present in all cases. Pericardial effusion in case of effusive constrictive pericarditis, IVS motion, paradoxic or flattened as a sign of ventricular interdependence, septal bounce and early diastolic septal notch the posterior motion related to the less compliant ventricular walls, flattening of LV posterior wall during diastole, respiratory variation in ventricular size, evidence of right-sided pressure overload, 
as for example septus shifting to the uh, to the left during inspiration and dilatation of the systemic vents the last two features that is the evidence of right sided pressure overload and dilatation of the systemic vents may present in any cases of right sided heart failure and they are not specific and pathognomonic of constrictive pericarditis here bersan and oxus view in a patient with constrictive pericarditis usually the patient with constrictive pericarditis states the echo window are um, so poor and unclear here we only can suspect that the pericardium is uh, mildly thick and high echogenic so we approach subcostally and here we can see that the thick and high echogenic pericardium around the rv and lv apex and there is minimal pericardial diffusion as this case was a case of constrict effusive constrictive pericarditis when we measured the pericardial thickness we found that it is a 5 mm so 5 mm pericardium and it is bright and high echogenic so it represent a calcific thick and pericardium of constrictive pericarditis here a mode echo showing septal bounds we can see the posterior motion of the septum during diastole as dr bodhisamman very nicely well explained the ventricular interdependence here we also seen that when the right ventricle uh, size increase during expiration the left ventricular size decreases because in case of constrictive pericarditis the intracardiac uh, intracardiac volume is fixed so we decrease in lv there is increase in rv this relation is fixed and septal bounds is one of the pathognomonic feature of constrictive pericarditis here is an, another mmodeco showing the flattened posterior wall during diastole and the posterior motion of the interventricular septum which are bloody label criteria for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis here is a diastolic frame of apical fourth member view recorded in early respiration showing left turn bowing of the septum this is also explained very nicely by the professor bodhisamman that when during respiration the rv size increase the septum shifts towards the left and the lv size decreases when this ratio between rv and lv is more than 1.1 it is almost diagnostic of constrictive pericarditis here is a subcostal echo window showing dilated rv with lack of respiratory collapse Doppler echocardiography provides important hemodynamic information. A number of Doppler findings are sensitive for pericardial constriction, but their absence does not exclude constrictive hem hemodynamics. The classic Doppler findings: an exaggerated EA ratio of mitral inflow with short DT and exaggerated respir respiratory variation in mitral EA velocity. When the mitral EA velocity with inspiration expiration varies more than 25 percent, it is considered as abnormal. Tricuspid inflow velocity show an opposite pattern to the transmitral velocities across tricuspid velocities increase with inspiration and decrease with expiration. Whereas across mitral wall velocity decreases with inspiration and increases with expiration. This was also explained by Professor Budhisman very nicely. So my job is relatively easier after his presentation. And past the Doppler of hepatic vein, there is an increase in diastolic flow reversal with expiration. This is very much important and one of the most specific marker of uh, echo marker for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis. Here uh, we can see the the exaggerated respiratory variation of mitral inflow and tricuspid inflow. In the upper panel, the mitral inflow. So with expiration, it indicates expiration there is increase in E wave velocity, and inspiration there is decrease in the E wave velocity. In the opposite way, that is the just opposite to the mitral mitral inflow, the tricuspid inflow. We can see that during inspiration, the E wave velocity increases, and during expiration, the E wave velocity decreases. so and this variation is more in case of mitral wall when this respiratory variation is more than 25% it is considered as abnormal and a feature of constrictive pericarditis here another case showing that the mitral inflow tricuspid inflow and hep hepatic venous flow there is less respiratory variation in case of mitral inflow but exaggerated respiratory variation in case of tricuspid inflow 
we can see that there is inspiratory increase in uh, e velocity and decrease in uh, during expiration. So there is exaggerated respiratory variation of tricuspid inflow. And there is phasic respiratory variation of hepatic venous flow. That flow, forward flow, confined only during inspiration. And during expiration, there is reversal. This is very much important and um, pathognomic of constrictive pericarditis, even in case of arrhythmia. When, uh, and uh, in case of when the, there is post-operative cases that like mitral valve replacement, this feature can be considered as a pathognomic sign of constrictive pericarditis. So tissue doctor imaging. TC doctor imaging derived annular velocities has provided new diagnostic criteria for constrictive pericarditis. In a heart without constrictive pericarditis, the lateral mitral uh, valve or uh, tricuspid valve annular velocity exceeds that of the medial annulus. With constrictive pericarditis, the thickened constrictive pericardium limits the motion of the lateral annulus but has no effect on medial mitral, medial annular velocity. Thus, there is both preservation of medial annular velocity and a compensated augmentation of apex to base shortening of septum relative to the lateral wall. So the medial annular velocity exceeds the lateral annular velocity. In normal situation, lateral to medial annular E prime ratio exceeds 1.2. Reversal of this ratio is term annulus reverses. In simple words, when the medial annular velocity exceeds the lateral annular velocity, this is known as the annulus reverses, and it is a reliable sign of constrictive pericarditis and considered as echo diagnostic criteria of constrictive pericarditis. Here is an example of annulus re reverses. We, we can see that the, when the pulse or wave Doppler, the cursor is placed in the septum, that is the medial annulus, the E prime velocity is 0.14 meter per second. But when it's placed on the lateral annulus, we can see that it is reduced. The E prime is 0.11 meter per second. So this is an example of annulus reverses, and it is a reliable criterion for diagnostic constrictive pericarditis. There is a confusion regarding differentiation of constrictive pericarditis from restricted cardiomyopathy, and always the questions regarding echocardiography in the exam asked what is the difference between constrictive pericarditis from restricted cardiomyopathy. So I want to highlight the important difference that in case of constriction, atrial size is usually normal, but in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is a biatrial dilatation. Pericardial appearance is thick and bright in case of constriction, but normal in restriction. Septal mo motion and position, there is abnormality in constriction, but normal in case of restricted cardiomyopathy. Mitral inflow are similar in both the cases, that is restricted pattern. Lateral annular e velocity is normal in case of constriction, but reduced in case of um, restricted cardiomyopathy. The ratio the medial annular velocity is more than lateral annular velocity in case of constriction, but medial annular velocity is less than lateral annular velocity in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Pulmonary hypertension is frequent in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. It's rare in case of constrictive pericarditis. LV size function may be normal in both cases. Tricuspid and mitral regurgitation are more frequent in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. There is respiratory variation of IVRT, that is isovolumic relaxation time in case of constriction, but stable in, in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Respiratory variation of mitral valve E wave velocity is exaggerated in case of constriction and normal in case of restriction. And if we do the color in mode mitral valve propagation velocity, it is increased in case of constriction, but reduced in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So these are the echo feature which are difference in between the two pathology, which are really confused sometimes. So here is Doppler, uh, conventional Doppler and tissue Doppler imaging in patient of uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy on the left and the constrictive pericarditis on the right. So uh, in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, that there is a restrictive pattern, tall E wave with short DT, but there is no remarkable respiratory variation. But in case of constrictive pericarditis, the similar pattern, but exaggerated respiratory variation, we can see that the mitral inflow increase during expiration and decrease during inspiration. And restrictive cardiomyopathy myocardial disease, so tissue velocity uniformly reduced both in lateral and medial annulus. 
But in case of constrictive pericarditis, the lateral annular velocity decreases compared to medial annulus, but there is not as much as restricting cardiomyopathy. Advanced imaging modality, strain imaging can differentiate, can help in differentiating restrictive cardiomyopathy from constrictive pericarditis. As well, the pericardium constrict the lateral free wall, so the global longitudinal strain is reduced in case of constrictive pericarditis, but the septum is unaffected. So in case of constrictive pericarditis, the septal strain is preserved, but the global longitudinal strain is reduced. On the other hand, in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, there is uniform reduction of strain as global longitudinal strain as well as septal strain. Apical rotation is affected in case of constrictive pericarditis but remain unaffected during restrictive cardiomyopathy. Actual septal strain, you see in the medial wall, so it is not affected by the constrictive pericarditis. So it, the actual septal reserve strain increases in case of constrictive pericarditis, but in case of restricted cardiomyopathy, it is reduced. So an RV longitudinal strain reduced in both cases. So this cannot differentiate the two cases, the septal strain, apical rotation, and the actual septal reserval strain. These three strain parameters can help in differentiating the constrictive pericarditis from the restricted cardiomyopathy. As there are many parameters which can suggest the echo diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis, make it simple. Your clinic just pointed out the five reliable parameters for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis. The, these five parameters are respira respiration related ventricular septal shift, variation in mitral inflow E velocity, and ratio of medial, mit medial mitral annular E prime velocity equal to more than nine centimeter per second. Ratio of medial mitral E prime to lateral E prime velocity and hepatic vein expiratory diastolic reversal ratio, that is the diastolic reversal velocity divided by diastolic forward velocity during expiration. If it is equal to more than more uh, 0 0.8, it is considered as pathognomic sign of diagnostic constrictive pericarditis. And among these five, the three red mark criteria, that is the respiration related ventricular septal shift, medial mitral annular E prime velocity equal to more than nine centimeter per second, and hepatic vein expiratory diastolic reversal ratio more than or equal to 0 0.8 are, are independently associated with the constrictive pericarditis. And this should be taken as the key message or key echo point for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis. The studies showed that the presence of respirophasic ventricular septal shift in combination with either medial mitral E prime velocity equal to more than nine centimeter per second or hepatic vein expiratory diastolic reversal ratio equal to more than 0 0.8 corresponded to sensitivity of 87% and a specificity of 91% to diagnostic constrictive pericarditis. So we should take these points, these parameters, and these echo features as the key points for diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. And we too should take these messages as the take home message for our echo diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. With this key message, I like to end my talk and I like to thank you all for patient hearing. I would like to request Professor Badiuzaman to continue his presentation. Okay. Thank you, Professor Tuhinaku. Made my job so easy. As everybody can understand, that was not my job to describe. Thank you, Professor Tuhinaku. So, after echocardiography, next uh, is a CT scan. Actually, high resolution CT scan can measure pericardial thickness and degree of calcification. A thickness of more than four millimeter is differentiates constrictive disease from restrictive cardiomyopathy. There are some supportive evidence like dilated, uh, dilated uh, vena cava, hepatic vein, dilated titatrium, ascites, hepatomus penegali. We can also do some preoperative planning by CT scans, such as degree and distribution of classification, anatomic relationship, and degree of adhesion, and coronary calcium score for the probable coronary artery disease. MRI. Uh, actually, ESC, uh, CT, and MRI is class one indication for uh, um, evaluation of constrictive pericarditis. In MRI, we can see the pericardial thickness and degree of calcification and, um, and other related abnormalities. And other important feature, which is uh, important here, is uh, elongated, elongated narrowing of the RV, atrial dilatation, 
And also like ECHO, we can also see hemodynamic feature in MRI, uh, septal bounce in early diaster. Most importantly, MRI with gadolinium enhancement, which it helps to identify the re re reversible component is still present in the constriction. If we see any reversible component that is persistent inflammation, then it may respond to anti-inflammatory agent. So this portion is very important uh, in diagnosing uh, in constant pericarditis. So what about the invasive uh, hemodynamics? When should we go for invasive hemodynamics? When all other imaging studies are non-diagnostic and when there is some contribution for multiple accessory associated pathologies like myocardial dysfunction, valvular disease, and pulmonary hypertension. Otherwise, echo is sufficient usually to diagnose constant pericarditis. So these are the summary of uh, right-sided heart, uh, right side, right heart carcerization. There will be elevated right and left ventricular diastolic pressure equalized to five millimeter mercury. RV systolic pressure will be less than 50. Mean RA pressure will be more than 15. RV ETP will be one third of the RV systolic pressure and RA pressure tracing will show mark wide descent. These are the following few features of right heart catheterization. Now, pericardial and endomyocardial biopsy, direct inspection of pericardial biopsy may be required for definitive diagnosis. In histology, we can see fibro uh, fibrotic thickening, chronic inflammation, granuloma, and calcification. But important is that despite the, all the best attempt in diagnosing constant pericarditis, confirming the diagnosis may be possible until at the time of surgical evaluation. That is, sometimes surgery is done to explore the possibility of, because all other modalities fail to diagnose until it is patient has gone for surgery. So this is the uh, summarized constant pericarditis, history, physical examination, lab test, advanced imaging, and hemodynamics. In history, we can get history of uh, cardiac procedures like surgery, radiation, history of radiation, history of antiquity disease, history of infection like TB. In physical examination, JBP shows uh, Y descent, X descent, and small sign. Lab, ECG, X-ray, usually non-specific. Advanced imaging, echocardiography, MRI, and CT shows anatomy like thickness, calcification and infusion and physiology like interventricular inter ventricular interdependence and pericardial inflammation and hemodynamics again says the worldwide already intrathoracic uh, intracardiac dissociation and ventricular discordance so these are the summary so now come to the management the most important part actually medical management there is no specific treatment uh, it may remain ineffective but Anti-inflammatory drug like NS8, COX-2 COX inhibitors, colchicine steroids may be beneficial if prominent inflammatory components are present. Diuretics is a mainly loop diuretics is a mainstay to relieve the congestion and optimize the volume status. Therapy shows the causative disease like tuberculosis, treat the complication like atrial arrhythmia, and beta blockers and non-dihydropyridine non, non uh, calcium blockers should be avoided because the tachycardia present during uh, is actually helpful for um, to maintain the cardiac output. So surgical management, pericardiectomy, complete pericardiectomy is the definitive therapy and is a potential cure. Earlier is better before myocardium is involved or heart failure ensues. There's two standard approach, anterolateral thoracotomy and medical sternotomy. Complications are extensive bleeding, arrhythmia, ventricular wall rupture. A surgical mortality is between five to 15% and perioperative mortality is 6.1%. So this is the step by step, though we are not surgeons, but we should see, uh, we should know what surgeons do actually. So what they do actually, they do a sternotomy. They expose the pericardium, this is the anterior pericardium. They remove part of the anterior pericardium. Then they remove the whole pericardium. They call it phrenic to phrenic, phrenic to phrenic, remove the whole anterior pericardium. They push the, just pull the uh, cardiac heart base up and remove the pericardium from the diaphragm and posterior part. And here you can see the complete pericardium done, leaving the phrenic nerve intact on the both side. So what is the independent predictors of outcome? It is the etiology, age, LB dysfunction. This is actually equivalent uh, clinic experience of 163 patients. They have found this etiology, age, and LB, dis uh, LB systolic function, pulmonary artery pressure, creatinine, and serum sodium are the independent predictors of outcome. So what is the difference between uh, constriction and tamponade? Both has low cardiac output status, both uh, jugular venous dilated, but here there is no uh, cosmos sign, but in constriction there is cosmos sign. 
in both sides there is equalized diastolic pressure but in uh, in tamponade y descent is blunted but in constriction y descent is rapid y descent and in tamponade heart sound is decreased but in constriction you may heart cardiac uh, pericardial knock regarding uh, constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy physical signs there is much no much difference because cosmos signs uh um, maybe also find in restrictive pericardial but pericardial knock are not present here ecg is always a non specific finding here but here it, it may show the features of non uh, pseudo infarction worrying of qrs complex left axis deviation and chest x ray one third of case may show calcification and here there is no calcification and mainly the all other difference act actually echocardiographic which already we discussed by very elegantly professor kumin hok has already shown so all main difference are only echocardiographic between constriction and restriction so there are some other types of pericarditis i will go through very fast there is what called effusive constrictive pericarditis actually this patients comes with pericardial tamponade once their tampon is removed their features of the show features of constrictive pericarditis it may be secondary to decreased pericardial compliance in the setting of acute inflammation usually occurs with tubercular pericarditis and therapy should be focused on treating active inflammation so this patient if inflammation is present anti inflammatory drug is, uh, is advised in this cases because it's may respond to anti inflammatory drug here you can see this patient before pericardial stenosis is showing the feature of uh, feature of tamponade there is blunted y descent after pericardial stenosis there is sharp y descent showing the feature of uh, constrictive pericarditis there is another called transient constrictive pericarditis this patient initially comes with acute pericarditis but it develops feature of constriction after acute process resolving or the patient who presents with constrictive pericarditis but responds well with corticosteroid and inflammatory therapy proliferation is still present and inflammatory markers and gadolinium enhancement mri are present as a sign of active inflammation so here we can should use anti inflammatory therapy for long long time as you can see this is a patient with transient constrictive pericarditis here before the anti inflammatory therapy the mri shows the constriction of the the thickened pericardium with gadolinium enhancement shows the evidence of inflammation so after 6 3 or 6 months in anti inflammatory anti inflammatory drug the inflammation and thickness has gone there is another interesting thing is called occult constrictive pericarditis this patient shows features of constrictive pericarditis only after fluid challenge actually this patient has low filling pressure due to over diuresis so the take home points are constrictive pericarditis is commonly misdiagnosed as a diastolic heart failure echocardiographic anatomical and echocardiographic hemodynamic assessment can be sufficient for diagnosis in majority of the cases mri can show hemodynamic events like septal bounds pericardial inflammation and pericardial myocardial adherence main stay of treatment of pericardic is pericardectomy for transient or effusive uh, constrictive pericarditis anti inflammatory agents can be tried for 3 to 6 months prognosis is mainly based on etiology and lastly it is a potentially curable cause of heart disease thank you thank you for patience hearing thank you very much i like to thanks both of you dr badu jawan and dr toyina for a wonderful presentation about the delicate subject of constrictive pericarditis because constrictive pericarditis always is a complicated one diagnosis is very tough and treatment is always very tough and that's why i again congratulate you dr badu jawan and dr toyina ha i also congratulated the other lecturers in this session and now we are talking about the discussion question and answers some questions said here to all panelists please colsicin is mandatory in every pericarditis i think this answer this has been already answered by smita on, online Yeah. Yes, uh, colchicine actually is indicated for all patients. The SC guidelines has uh, recommended or colchicine as a class one indication. It is But recommended. Next questions was uh, treatment of COVID induced pericarditis. Well, that is very uh, interesting. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it has not been written in any book, but some uh, journal shows the treatment are as of like the anti-inflammatory. Patients with COVID actually may present in so either there, ways. Like there are a few few case reports. Uh, uh, either patients having pericarditis develop COVID or patient first develop COVID then followed by as a part of complication develop pericarditis or effusion. In both the cases, the anti-inflammatory they study, the anti-inflammatory drugs well. And also an, another drug, the an interleukin antagonist, which is also work well like the other anti-inflammatory drugs. And this is all about from my, yeah, if anyone, and that's any okay. expert. So, so the case reports as, uh, as has been published, they have shown uh, like all effusion, they have been followed up with anti-inflammatory drugs. When there is tamponade, it was drained. And once drained, they did not find any evidence of uh, any MR, any, any RNA of COVID uh, virus in the uh, in the mm -hmm. pericardial fluid. It was said to be myopericarditis of uh, COVID-induced infection. Yeah, I don't think there is uh, any separate med medication for COVID-induced uh, pericarditis. All the same. Treat COVID and it will be cured automatically. Exactly. Next question to all. What tumor markers can you do in pericard Is it? It is all answered. I think uh, Dr. Tafik Shari has already answered. I answered it, sir, already. Yeah. These are some uh, carbo carbohydrate antigens that are from breast or, or bone cancer that can be uh, identified. Okay. Another question is role of diuretics in mild to moderate pericardial efficiency and treatment of post MI pericardial effusion. Tarek, Tarek, Bolvina, Dr. All, all, all panelists. Sita? Uh, what the, was the topic, sir? The Following myocardial infarction, the pericardial infusion treatment, if there is an hemodynamic unstable, that means pulse blood pressure is blood pressure reduced, patient is hemodynamic unstable, we should go the pericardial infusion. But if the patient is hemodynamic, we can treat with diabetes. Okay. Okay. And next, this is the last question I have seen here. What is the confirmatory investigation to diagnose the constrictive pericarditis? What is the question? What is the confirmatory investigation to diagnose the <laughs> constrictive pericarditis? Uh, yeah, is... We already very brilliantly discussed by Kuhinok. There are three echocardi echocardiographic features, which is almost diagnostic of uh, actually because no lab investigation or diagnostic, no lab investigation, neither X-ray nor lab investigation. MRI and CT scan may help to diagnose, but the diagnostic feature is in the eco and invasive hemodynamics. So eco, I, I think Professor Tuvinok will say the three features of uh, eco, which is a diagnostic. He, she also mentioned, she can repeat if one, she wants to. Professor Tuvinok. Okay. The respiratory related septal shift, that is the posterior motion of the septal, septal bounce, and the uh, lateral annular velocity and medial annular velocity ratio, especially when the medial annular velocity is equal to more than nine centimeter, and the hepatic uh, venous flow, the expiratory reversal, the ratio between the expiratory reversal and the diastolic forward flow when it is equal to more than 0 0.8. These three criteria are the most important for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis. Yeah, similarly, in hemodynamics also, that's uh, interdependence and ventricular discordance and, and shown in different ways, the almost diagnostic of uh, constrictive pericarditis because clinical features, lab investigations are nothing are diagnostic. So I think we don't have any more questions. Yeah. So Dr. No. Uh, Arun Musk is there. I think she, uh, yeah. Arun Musk, please. Maske, where are you? And oh, we hi. have Mr. Kader Akhand also. So yeah. uh, after Arun yeah. Musk, you must uh, ask Professor Kader Akhand to make some comments. Yes, definitely. He will comment at the end of the session, most likely. And he will conclude the session. Yeah. 
Arun Maski, please. Oh, this was a very nice uh, uh, presentation, short and uh, good, very good presentation at least. I mean, if you talk about constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade, no matter how you read, see, when you're doing echo, you're always confused. So this was a brilliant presentation and this was very helpful. Thank you. And timing is also, I think, appropriate for us. Uh, doing 8 p.m. in Bangladesh time, I think it's appropriate. So many of our residents have joined. So that's very timely, uh, good, uh, good timing. So thank you, Fazila Ma'am and Heart Foundation for organizing this sort of uh, beautiful lectures. Thank you uh, to all the speakers. Maski, how are you? Oh, fine, Tariq. How are you? You are, you are in uh, Heart Foundation now? Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Can you recognize Tarek now? Can you recognize him? Yeah, yeah, sir, yeah. He's my classmate him. in Ambulance. <laughs> he's a, uh, we, we completed the Ambulance in Chitang Medical College in same session. I know, I know. Yeah. And that's right. Daughter, any other panelists, please, except Daughter Abdul Kader Akhan? We've got. <laughs> Professor Amol. Amol is not there. Amol, yeah. si na to. Amol is left the area yeah. because of his feeling uneasy. She was unwell, huh? feeling unwell, huh? exactly. Dr. Abdul Kader Akan, Professor Abdul Kader Akan, please comment something. Thank you, Professor Nazir Ahmed, for asking me to pass some comments. But uh, first comment is the lecture on pericardial disease involving all parts, starting from the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiologic changes, and correlation with the clinical finding with pathophysiologic changes. It is excellent. I must say it is excellent. And I learned a lot from this lecture. All, all speaker at least talk some new events and new to me at least. So from the core of my heart, I express my gratitude and thanks to the organizer for uh, inviting me in such a nice program. Pericardial disease is actually a boring subject, but the speakers made it very pleasant and palatable. So that is an important issue. So they left nothing for us they discuss the ECG changes, discuss the therapeutic option, uh, everything, everything is covered. And so I will not pass any comment, just I will tell one thing uh, regarding the presentation of Dr. Uh, Dr. Smita. Mm -hmm. She mentioned every finding in pericardial, pericarditis diagnosis in ECG. She mentioned everything, but I want to add one point that, uh, in ECG, the, she told that the PR segment elevation, deviation, etc. But in ECG, conventionally we say there is ST segment elevation in most of the lead except AVR, where there is ST depression. And the morphology of the ST segment elevation is basically the concavity upwards. It is a very simple, common, and all of we know. Sometimes it makes difficult, especially when there is involvement of the inferior lead and in that situation, we can differentiate because we know the vector of the pericardium is directed towards the lead two. So if we get the AST elevation maximum in the lead two, that is the important point by which we can differentiate the pericarditis from the AST elevated TMI. That is the important point because the vector is not towards the two. In inferior myocardial infarction, the vector is directed towards the lead three. That helps to differentiate these two points, but there is limitation as well. When there is inferior infarction involving the circumflex artery in that situation, this scenario might change and might, might produce some confusion. So that is one important point. And actually uh, the points by who is the differentiated the constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is really a challenge. Challenge to differentiate the uh, Professor Tuhinhoff uh, 
Mani mentioned the important points by which she differentiated the pericarditis from the constrictive pericarditis and in invasive procedure, square root sign. These are very important points. But in some situations, even by all these means, it may not be possible to differentiate these two points. And one practical experience I, I want to know from Professor Tuhinok, this is not related to this subject, but today I, we are thinking in one patient echocardiographic problem. We uh, evaluated a patient of mitral stenosis, mitral valve area is 0.8, significant gradient across mitral valve, and it is uh, suitable for the mitral valvotomy, PTMC, it is suitable for PTMC. But one finding produced confusion that both right atrium and left atrium is dilated, leaving the normal size of the left ventricle and right ventricle. So today we are discussing in my department, the, is it a fissure of constrictive pericarditis in, my, in association with mitral stenosis? Or the mitral stenosis itself can produce this kind of changes? This is one issue. And can you guide me that should we go for the PTMC of this patient? Or there is any uh, uh, suggestion? If there is actual fibrillation, uh, left actual dilatation is due to, can you hear me? Left actual dilatation is due to Regurgitation, there may uh, RA may be dilated, so there may be biaxial dilatation. Restrictive constrictive pericarditis, biaxial dilatation is very rare. Dilatation is common, so uh, we have to correlate the clinical findings with the echo findings. Restrictive cardiomyopathy and the valve morphology is dummy. Tricuspid regurgitation is not very significant, and pulmonary pressure is not very high. There is mild pulmonary hypertension, mild tricuspid. Is the patient in? Uh, we are really in our department. We are really puzzled how this kind of finding we are getting in this patient. Diagnosed is could it be? There is no significant right ventricular hypertrophy as well. First, I thought that there might be some right ventricular hypertrophy, why the right ventricle is not dilated at that time, and that produced the dilatation of the right atrium. But well, the, the measurement does not support the right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Well, I think this patient might, uh, might uh, this patient having rheumatic heart disease, um, uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, maybe, uh, maybe she, uh, she's a uh, lady, she might have uh, also features of restricted cardiomyopathy because uh, by actual enlargement uh, with uh, both ventricles not dilated is a, uh, is a good feature of uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. So uh, why not? Maybe the, 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 these two pathologies coexistence in this patient. So I, you can go for uh, further evaluation of this patient. And PTMC is no harm. Doing PTMC is almost, uh, I think you can do for, go for PTMC. And then after PTMC, you can evaluate the patient. Uh, maybe after PTMC, you see what, what happens to the atrium. After PTMC, if the atrium comes to normal, then you can, we can assume that it was due to uh, mitral stenosis. But if after PTMC, still the both atria dilated and both ventricles are short, uh, small, then we can evaluate and further in the line of restrictive myocarditis or other thing. I think that's, that might be a better idea. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Uh, it has got some relation with this presentation, but uh, it is different. Yeah, actually, and wonderful question, I think. It is a problem I found today in my department. My Aspen professor asked me, this is the finding, what should we do? But in case of actual fibrillation, this is very common. If the patient has actual fibrillation, then it's very commonly found. Sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm. Is, is 25, 26, like that. Female patient. Pretty MC for then. Other yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> well, Professor Kader Akhan, first, please let me thank you for agreeing to come. I've been asking you so many times to come and always you've said you're busy, but this time you made it and this has made us very happy. Thank you. Having said that, you see, we have uh, you as one of our expert, uh, you know, experts on uh, examiner's perspective. 
So could you give us some tips to our students of what questions you might be asking them or what might be relevant for them for the exams? I mean, this is a very comprehensive discussion we had, but what would you expect a student when he sits in exam in front of you from this topic? Actually, this, what is your question? this is a theoretical topic. Practically, it is, though it is a practical question, but in exam, it is a theoretical discussion. Mostly the question sets in the written exam, constrictive pericarditis, how we we'll differentiate constrictive and restrictive, and all answer is given by the speakers. So if a student follow this lecture, they will not be Money able to omit any question. They parvina, Tara question omit correct a parvina. Arakta Jinish Amad Rashi Shetoche X Rethi. X ray Roneshuma X shell appearance at a thake, she come X ray thakle, Porikar Hole X ray, the X ray thake hoite related to act of Proshno Ashi. Eco to Shadaroto in most of the exam E Zatu eco Porikat, Shadaroto Dawaina. It is basically the written exam question as well as some situation, the X-ray is given in constrictive pericard where there is clean cut uh, calcification and thickening of the pericardium is visible. Otherwise, it is uh, this case is not given in exam as a long case or short case. Thank you. Dr. Ashok. Dr. Ashok. Sir, uh, sir, I'm on the way, sir, actually, in the car. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you. And now I'd like to conclude the session, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night.